talk a little bit about the spinal cord and some of the basic structures of it, uh, as well as a little bit about spinal nerves. Granted, I will do another show about spinal nerves that will discuss uh, kind of in general what's going on once they leave the spinal cord. Uh, the spinal cord is really kind of a continuation of that central nervous system after it leaves, the, if you talk about the brain stem, after it leaves the skull, it is considered to be the spinal cord. It is really the spinal cord until about, uh, you get into the lower end of the ribs. Uh, it's about 17 inches long. Off this, you're going to have 31 pairs of nerves. So paired nerves on each side and 31 of those sets as they are leaving the spinal cord. Uh, we will see later on that they definitely go to certain areas of the body and are doing some type of innervation in a lot of these areas. Um, if you look at the spinal cord, and this is within those vertebrae, this is going to be the small area there. It is in actuality, the diameter of the spinal cord in most cases is about the diameter of a dime. Uh, so it's it's not as big as what you might think on there. I always kind of think it looks like kind of like a scorpion when you see like the image like this. Uh, it's kind of flattened, like I said, front to back. Has fissures as well as a sulcus on there. They're both pretty deep going into that center. You have white matter on the outside that is axons that are ascending and descending tracks going to and from the spinal from the brain. Uh, within the center, you have the gray matter, which is going to be inner neurons and really some of these they are they have been mapped somewhat but again i don't get super crazy into anatomy of the spinal cord in terms of what's going where and what regions are going where uh, but the white matter is going to again be taking messages to and from the brain the gray matter is going to be doing some minimal processing in the spinal cord or acting as cells that relay stuff message coming in from one of these different roots here into this gray matter then gets relayed sent to a tract here up or down Again, to me, it kind of looks like an H or a butterfly. You have these, what are called dorsal horns going out the back, ventral kind of horns going out the front, as well as a little bump out on the side as well called lateral horns. Those are those different masses of gray matter. They are connected through the center of that H by what is called the gray commissure. Commissural means kind of connecting the two sides. We'll see that in commissural tracks when we get to the brain later on of white matter. Uh, you also have what are called these groups of white matter on each one of these things here in these different areas that we actually call funiculi that we'll talk about in just a little bit. But those are separated by these different horns. Uh, again, all this gray matter is cell bodies of the central nervous system. Uh, the gray matter we're going to see does change as you kind of look at it through different areas of the spinal cord. If we look up in the cervical region, you can see there is a lot more white matter relative to the gray matter. And as we get further down, I mean, technically the sacrum is not true spinal cord anymore it is just it's branched out into what's called the cauda equina at that point but you can see the gray matter becomes a bigger and bigger portion as you get further down the spinal cord i always kind of use the analogy of like a high-rise hotel and the elevator bank if you were to flip a person on their head and think about the brain as being the lobby any ascending or descending tract anything going from the brain to out to the body is going to have to go through that neck region for the most part so because of that, we have a lot of white matter tracks there. As those start then exiting that central nervous system and becoming part of the peripheral nervous system, we end up having less tracks necessary to take more of those down there. So again, kind of like a lobby there, everybody gets on the elevators there. As you go further and further up in a building, there's going to tend to be less and less people that are riding the elevator all the way up. So same thing here. We're going to have ascending and descending tracks, but there tends to have to be less of them as we get further down that spinal cord or further up in a building where there's less messages that need to be taken there. Again, one of the things you'll notice in the spinal cord, gray matter is in the interior, white matter is on the exterior. We're going to see the brain. It's actually kind of opposite of that. But to me, this makes sense. You have the information coming in one of those roots. So this would be the dorsal side right here where I have the cursor. It's going to bring uh, information in the back here. It can get figured out here and then relayed to an ascending or descending track. Up or down it goes. Same thing. Message can come down. It goes over here, out the ventral route to do something there. So to me, it makes sense, the layout there. And again, we'll see also with the brain, the layout of the gray and white matter to me makes a lot of logical sense in terms of how it's put together. 
Again, the gray matter, we have these lateral horns. Is Again, we'll see the dorsal side here. So this part back here, it is going to be sensory and, uh, excuse me, somatic and visceral motor. Uh, the dorsal root is bringing motor information, excuse me, not motor, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's going to be sensory information coming back. So the dorsal root is bringing sensory information back in here. The ventral root is going to have a lot of that visceral and uh, somatic motor. It's going to be doing that. So like it says here, the lateral horns here, more in the ventral side here, has some of that visceral motor inner neurons. Uh, again, dorsal root is bringing the sensory fibers back in, which can kind of deal with the uh, inner neurons that are dealing with sensory information. We then have areas of inner neurons here that are dealing with motor information and you can actually see this on this side right here. So you can see on that dorsal root, somatic sensory, visceral sensory, on the ventral root and that lateral horn here, uh, somatic motor and visceral motor. Um, just to go back for a second here, the dorsal root ganglion is the other thing you'll see on the dorsal side there. That is the group of cell bodies that are those sensory neurons. So if you remember from last semester, we talked about unipolar neurons and that they are kind of shaped like a T with the cell body off to the side. All the cell bodies of those sensory neurons are in that dorsal root ganglion. So again, the white matter are subdivided into what are called funiculi. Again, depending on where they are, if they're in the area behind that dorsal horn, that is the posterior funiculus, kind of in this area to the side, lateral funiculus, and then in front of that ventral horn right here, that is going to be the anterior funiculus. Uh, again, these are ascending and descending tracks, so taking messages that are up to the brain or down from the brain through these areas of white, white matter, again, which are myelinated axons. So the spinal nerves, like I said, 31 pairs of these going out. Again, each paired nerve is going to have a sensory on the dorsal side coming back in, a ventral root on the front side, taking motor information out. Those gather together to make one of the two spinal nerve pairs. Uh, how these are named are a lot like how we named the vertebrae, where the first set of nerves going out is C1 up to C8. Granted, we only had seven actual vertebrae there. But then you can see T1 through T12, L1 through L5, or 6 there, excuse me, 6, sorry, 5, uh, S1 through S5, it just looks like a 6 on here, sorry, I misread it. And then you have one coccygeal nerve down here. So that is how these are numbered out. And again, these have been mapped in terms of what they're doing and what they're innervating. We're going to see in some of these, you will get some of this inner branching right here. We'll talk about some other one here, but where you have multiple... Uh, Spinal nerves kind of re resetting themselves into what are going to be peripheral nerves. So all of C1 is not in this nerve. All of C2 is not in this nerve, or for example, or C4 or 5, whatever. But these are kind of parts of these roots are branching off and making what are going to be the, some of the main nerves going into that upper arm. So like the median nerve and the radial, uh, excuse me, yeah, the radial and ulnar nerves and... Uh, things like that. So, and those are called a plexus. And again, we'll talk about those. We actually have four of them, a cervical plexus, a brachial plexus, a lumbar plexus, and a sacral plexus. We will, again, we'll talk about those in a kind of 20 slide spinal nerve breakdown. So again, they have these two roots, like I was already saying, that dorsal root and the ventral root. The ventral roots are motor, while the dorsal roots are sensory. And you can see how those two roots are going together to make that nerve. And you can see how this is a pair of nerves right here. Again, the spinal cord continues down. It's about 17 inch, about, like it says here, stands about 17 inches to just below the last rib. It's about L1 vertebrae. At that point, it starts kind of subdividing into all these little parts, which is referred to as the cauda equina, uh, which is actually... Latin for horse's tail, because they think this structure right here, as you get to this cauda equina, they thought that looked like a horse's tail when they saw it in a dissected human at some point. Uh, you do have this cone shape right here. That is that conus medullaris, where it is coming down to that point. And then, like I said, after that, it is all 
kind of branches of that spinal cord that are continuing down, but it's not a single structure any longer at that point, but more of groups of nerves or groups of tracks traveling together. Uh, another thing we want to talk about is a lot of times with the spinal cord, you're going to get what are referred to as spinal reflexes. So a lot of times we talk about a spinal reflex arc. This is kind of a combination of these five parts, a receptor that is going to be registering something. So if you think of like the knee jerk response, you have somebody hitting the patella. This creates a stimulus, which triggers a stretch receptor. That stretch receptor can send that information up a sensory neuron. It gets to the central nervous system here. You have the inner neuron, which is the green right here, that or integration center. It could be one neuron, it could be multiple ones. It is going to determine what response should happen, sends that information out a motor neuron, which is the fourth part, back down to what we refer to as an effector, which in this case is the muscles which cause your leg to kick out. Again, this is a protective mechanism, so that muscle does not get overstretched in this case. You may have seen this with touching a hot pan and that withdraw response, that is also a reflex arc, and that is also a spinal reflex. So it gives you an example of that. Reflexes, like I said, involving skeletal muscles are referred to as somatic ones, ones that are controlled through the autonomic system are autonomic. Some things are learned, some of these are inborn, like the blink response, like the Star Wars response to a loud noise, are inborn, and you'll do it as an infant, you'll do it as an adult. If you hear a loud bang, you will duck and do something like that. Uh, Infants also will respond to a loud noise like that. So some of these inborn, some are learned responses. Uh, we've talked about in psych before, things like conditioned response, Pavlov's dog. You could actually train a human baby to drool at the sight of food, probably. If you continue to ring a bell and present food, they, you could ring a bell and they'd probably drool. Just like Pavlov's dog did. It's going to be tough to tell because babies always drool anyways. But this is kind of that mapped out. To me, this is stuff to know. Understand the parts of a reflex arc and what they're doing, uh, where they'd be located. Uh, important to know that type of stuff. Uh, again, something you could ask in an essay style or you could ask in multiple choice. Have you kind of doing something along those lines? Uh, again, when we talk about gray and white matter, it is neuronal cell bodies so that as well as the dendrites are going to be the gray matter if we talk about groups of cell bodies in the central nervous system we refer to this as a nuclei or single would be nucleus uh, we'll talk about a basal nuclei or basal nucleus in the brain basal nuclei because there's one on each side uh, we talk about areas of white fibers traveling within the central nervous system we refer to those as tracks so this corpus callosum right here is considered to be a commissural track. It's connecting these two sides, this area of white matter. Uh, again, tracks, ascending and descending tracks there. We know peripheral nervous system, we talk about groups of cell bodies being a ganglion. Uh, groups of axons together being a nerve. So that's where it's a little bit different. Uh, and again, this is what they are. I'm not going to read this one again here, but again, we know what the gray and white matter are. And again, you can see brain, the layout is different. You can see there's areas of gray matter at the base of this. Uh, we can see mostly the gray matter is to the exterior of the brain. And again, this makes sense. The brain is have, doing a lot of processing. It's a lot easier to connect like this than to have all the gray matter in the interior and you're trying to run all these connections around the outside. It's a lot quicker and easier to increase the surface area here and have small connections either here. It's a shorter distance. Same thing here, shorter distance than having all this gray matter in the interior and you have all this stuff trying to work its way around. Logically, it makes sense how the brain, gray matter and white matter is also laid out. And you can see the white matter with it lit up in this image. So that kind of gives us the spinal cord and the brain. What we're going to start working through after this is going to be a lot more of the parts of the brain. So the cerebrum, the cerebellum, what they're doing, what are some of the subdivisions within those areas, and what are their functions. Um, that's what we're going to be moving on to. So I will talk to you next time.